I'd like to introduce Joel Miner. Joel is the curator of the Modern Literature Collection in Manuscripts at Washington University in St. Louis. He has led numerous Merrill-related projects over the past nine years at WashU, including a digital humanities project with Book of Ephraim drafts and Ouija board transcripts, the James Merrill Life and Art Digital Exhibit, the James Merrill Symposium in 2015, and the digitization of the thousands of photographs in the James Merrill papers. Please welcome Joel Miner. Thank you, Lauren, and welcome everyone. Um, thanks for coming. I'm excited to be your host today um, for I know what I know will be a fun and stimulating conversation. A uh, special thanks uh, goes out first to, uh, to James Merrill House. Uh, they're partnering with us on this series of book events and the April 10th event, the first one uh, they hosted is available on their YouTube channel. And we will have information at the end of today's program about two related events coming up. So I'm gonna start with a few words and a short presentation about the uh, James Merrill resources in the Modern Literature Collection at Washington University Libraries. We're really proud of our uh, long association with James Merrill, his generosity and that of his family and friends has made the Modern Literature Collection a much richer resource in more ways than one. We like to call the James Merrill papers a uh, cradle to grave archive, spanning from the earliest memorabilia such as his christening gown and baby book, through thousands of poem drafts, journals, letters, and photos, to his bronze death mask seen here. Merrill has been the cornerstone of the modern literature collection since it was founded in 1964, when friend and fellow poet Mona Van Dyne personally invited him to deposit his papers here. The collection has grown to 310 boxes, and we continue to acquire correspondence and other materials from as many friends and acquaintances, sometimes adding them to the Merrill papers and sometimes creating separate collections. Merrill also left us his literary copyright and an endowment for our special collections, and his mother's Plummer Foundation has provided us significant grants for Merrill-related projects, events, and acquisitions. As I mentioned, there have been significant growth of the Merrill papers, uh, as well as related collections through the years. Many friends and family members and heirs uh, contributed material since Merrill's death in 1995, including letters, many of which show up in a whole world. So here are some names. It's not an exhaustive list, but um, many of them in recent years. And um, <clears throat> this picture here is, uh, of Mona Van Dyne with Merrill and David Jackson and Mona's husband, Jarvis Thurston, um, taken in Key West by, probably by Peter Hooten um, because there's a similar picture uh, with um, uh, Mona and, and Peter. I'd like to uh, talk about our online resources really quick. Um, we have uh, many of these, six so far. Um, James Merrill, Other Writings, consists of essays on and images of the different genres of Merrill's writing found in his papers. And we have an exhibit catalog uh, available uh, of this, which uh, is free, and I'm happy to send you one if you just contact me. Um, the James Merrill Digital Archive, Materials for the Book of Ephraim, contains um, all of the Ouija board transcripts that we have, as well as Book of Ephraim drafts. And this is a collaboration with the Humanities Digital Workshop here at WashU, and also includes related materials from the Stephen Yenser papers at the Beinecke Library. And then the Modern Literature Collection, first 50 years, uh, was created, uh, as you might expect, uh, on our 50th anniversary, and includes Merrill uh, correspondence drafts, juvenilia, audio, and video. James Merrill Life and Archive uh, is modeled on the 2015 biography of Life and Art by Langdon Hammer and show, showcases important archival items that played a role in that book. And we're gonna look at a, a few of those in a few minutes here. Uh, James Merrill's Poetry Manuscripts is Tim Maderer's ongoing study of drafts and related 
materials for a more in-depth look at many of his most uh, celebrated poems. And then the photographs from the James Arnold Papers on Art Store uh, is a password protected collection of all 7,626 scanned photos <laughs> so far. <laughs> So we wanted to start the discussion today with um, looking at a handful of uh, digitized letters that are available online, some of which are in the book and some of which are not. I'll show you what we have. Lauren will put the links to them in the chat and then I will introduce the panelists and we'll get the conversation started. So first uh, is uh, a note from uh, little Jimmy uh, as a child to his governess, Leila Zelly Howard whom many of you probably know was uh, uh, an inspiration for uh, Lost in Translation. We have a, a letter with a photograph uh, to Marilyn Lavin um, from 1952, um, <clears throat> which is in the book and um, came to us more recently from uh, Marilyn Lavin uh, donating uh, materials to us. Two David Jackson items. Uh, one, uh, the first uh, piece of correspondence from Merrill to Jackson in 1953, this postcard you see on the left. And then a um, occasional poem, which is in the correspondence uh, on the occasion of uh, David Jackson's 40th birthday. And we might discuss whether this counts as a letter or not, but it's a great visual. And um, we have a 1964 letter to Daryl Heim from Athens, Greece. Um, kind of a, a, an interesting, uh, typical type letter from Merrill. Uh, kind of a, a big block of text. And then a, a holograph letter uh, written in 1986 to Peter Hooten um, while Peter was sleeping in the hotel room. And uh, Merrill had some some things to get off his chest um, at the time. So it's a letter written to someone who's in the same room. Um, <clears throat> now I'll introduce the panelists and, and um, I'm gonna leave the slideshow up for now as I do that. If you all have gallery view on, you'll be able to see all their faces and they can wave and then I uh, introduce them. So Langdon Hammer is the Neil Gray Junior Professor of English at Yale University. His books include James Merrill, Life and Art and Hart Crane and Alan Tate. Janice-based modernism. He also edited the Library of America volumes of Hart Crane's poetry and May Swenson's poems. He writes about poetry for the New York Review of Books and the American Scholar, where he serves as poetry editor. Chelsea Malizek recently received her PhD in English from Yale University with a dissertation on poetic diction in contemporary poetry. She is a visiting assistant professor at Hamden Sydney College. Her work has appeared in the Three Penny Review and the Los Angeles Review of Books. Stephen Yenser's most recent volume of poems is Stone Fruit. He has written three critical books, including The Consuming Myth, the works of James Merrill, which I unfortunately don't have behind me, but, um, um, and um, co-edited five volumes, including the, the book of uh, letters um, of Merrill's writing and published an annotated edition of Merrill's book at Deep Run most recently, which I highly recommend. And Timothy Young is curator of modern books and manuscripts at Yale University's Beinecke Library, focusing on modern literary and cultural movements, including the avant-garde, children's literature, financial history, and playing cards and games. He is the author and or editor of the Great Mirror of Folly, Finance, Culture, and the Crash of 1720, The Collect Uncollected, David Rakoff, and Storytime Essays on the Betsy Beinecke Shirley Collection of Children's Literature. So welcome to everybody, and thanks for, thanks for waiting. Um, and I wanted to maybe start with our co-editors, Stephen and, and Lanny, and um, taking a look at our um, our letters we have for the audience and you all today. Um, see if you had anything you wanted to point out about them of interest and um, also maybe get into a little bit of your editorial decisions and what went into the book and what didn't. Sure. Um, 
But uh, first, for Stephen and I, we have a big thank you and acknowledgement to you, Joel, and to your colleagues present and past uh, for our collaboration. I think you know the work that that Stephen and I have done uh, is so bound up with and dependent on um, the work that you do um, that uh, we're we're really grateful for this. Well, thank you. Amen. Amen. Um, and, and thanks for these uh, digital images, which anybody can find with a couple of clicks uh, on the Special Collections website at WashU. Um, I wanted to say a, a, a couple of things about them um, in relation to our book, um, in part because they show things that are not in the book. And I mean both in the sense that there are letters here that we did not produce in the book, such as that wonderful Valentine to uh, Zelly. Stephen, why didn't we put that in? <laughs> <laughs> I kept I, wondering I, about several of these yeah, letters that um, they should have been. Okay, uh, next edition. So, um, uh, I mean, it, this is really is a terrific letter and, and uh, it demonstrates a couple of things that, that I guess I wanna emphasize about the interest of letters that our book only can capture perhaps peripherally at best. And that is the kind of materiality of the page. Um, he, we see here what is lost in transcription, which is the writer's hand. Uh, in this case, a child's hand. Um, and this particular letter is so, um, uh, it is such a charged object that the author, James Merrill, little boy, has kissed it. And he's asking his governess to kiss it where he kissed it so that she can kiss him. And, you know, that catches this, uh, you know, tangible dimension of the letter as an object that is exchanged between people um, that we, uh, you know, uh, can at best gesture towards in, in um, the, um, the text that we've made out of these letters. But one can, uh... One can see here, in addition to the to the hand and the that immediacy, the the beginning of the poetic sensibility, as he says here towards the end of the letter. Uh, I've been rummaging through my drawers, uh, but I can't find anything to give you but love. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And and that that little figure of speech, I think, is terrific. I've been rummaging through my drawers. I, I mean, that's something that could have come up in a letter twenty years later, or indeed forty years later. Uh, so it's a nice combination of the the two mm -hmm. things. And, and it's one of many that that are in our collection of of, of these kind of letters where he is pouring out love for her and, 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 and apologizing for being naughty and all this stuff. Yes. <laughs> it's really amazing. There's a, there's a sentiment here that uh, is not so obvious uh, in, in the later Merrill. Uh, that is to say by later Merrill, I mean, after he's about 20 years old. Uh, so the, the forthcomingness of this note is, is, is something. He, he liked uh, understatement, uh, of course, famously, and irony and dryness. Uh, and so it's, it's wonderful to see this, uh, the heart of things here. Yeah. Um, Joel, maybe you could uh, skip ahead to the uh, Daryl Hine letter sure. uh, from November 17th, uh, 1964. Um, couple of things I wanted to say about this one, which is a, a letter I, I love. It's the uh, first letter in which he introduces his lover, Stratum of Lizalis, who he is describing for his friend, Daryl Hine, poet, uh, classicist, later editor uh, of Poetry Magazine. Um, 
I, you know, um, you can just barely catch it on the screen right now, but um, along with um, the kind of materiality of the hand, there's the materiality of the paper uh, that I wish we could reproduce. It's onion skin. Uh, you know, you can just see this packed into uh, uh, an airmail letter uh, in uh, 1964 from Athens to, I don't know where Hein was, uh, probably um, maybe Chicago at that point. Um, and it, 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 um, it captures even this in this kind of material way, a kind of um, era that is no longer part of our lives. Um, two other things I wanted to say about, about this one. Um, notice how Merrill's packed the paper. I mean, that is to say he's packed the page. This is not unusual. Uh, it is as if he took the page as a kind of pre-existing form for his letters and uh, filled it. Uh, I think you can sometimes calibrate how he felt both about the addressee and the uh, occasion by how much he filled it uh, and just how, uh, um, how much he wanted to give to this particular letter. Um, you can see in this case, it's a lot. <clears throat> Uh, he, he, uh, he has a lot to say, and it is a letter that's full of sex, um, literature, uh, anecdotes, um, a certain amount of um, travelogue, uh, and in those ways, if you look at that page crammed with sentences, uh, it is a nice miniature of Merrill's drive to somehow get a whole world into his letters uh, and into uh, onto a particular page. Uh, it's also a hilarious letter, uh, which I'll I'll just recommend everyone go out and read. Um, 17 November 1964. And the book too. <laughs> yeah, that's, you can buy the book and then. <laughs> uh, but but it, I think it's available on your website, right? Yes, yes, for sure. Um, well, well, actually, one more thing I wanted to say about this one is um, that's typewritten, uh, free form, and there's not a mistake in it. <laughs> uh, is that also a common thing you, you would see in Merrill's letters? Not, not many uh, corrections? Very few. Right. He, um, he ma made a few habitual mistakes. Uh, but not very many of those. Um, in fact, uh, there's kind kind of funny uh, story that uh, Chelsea will will appreciate. He, he um, one word that he misspelled uh, often was cemetery. He used an A at the end instead of an E, and. Uh, we and I had in some early versions corrected that, but then we had to say something in the forward about the occasional mistakes that he made. Uh, and in order to justify the comment and in order to be fully honest and transparent, I had to go back and uncorrect, use my search function and uncorrect cemetery uh. Uh, back to its original misspelling. And it got complicated because once or twice he used the real space, he actually got it right. Uh, and so I was in some doubt at the end exactly how many of the cemeteries to rectify and how many to just leave. Uh, but it, it worked out. Um, so, so you see the important kinds of question that Stephen and I wrestled with hours and hours on that one. And Ch Chelsea, Chelsea was uh, a, a major contributor to, to that discussion. Uh, the, the, the term was texture. We wanted some texture uh, in, these, in these letters. And uh, uh, I, I hope we got it. Well, yeah, I would like to bring in Chelsea and Tim about, you know, seeing these letters and anything, does it bring anything back for you when working with them? <laughs> I know that Chelsea wanted to talk about this one in particular from Maryland. Yeah. yeah, I think, Stephen, in terms of texture, I think this is the one where I feel like we got it really right. Because when we transcribed it, 
we knew we had to do something with this X, right? Oh, yeah. I'm here. There's no way we couldn't do it. So in the book, we ended up with sort of parenthetical X drawn from boat image on letterhead to this place in text, <laughs> right. which is sort of clunky, but I think necessary to know sort of how much paratext or like, you know, specifically the letterhead that Merrill's writing on really played with his letter. He brought it in a lot. Um, yes. In the late 80s, I think there's a letter to you where he's writing about his Ouija board letterhead. And he's like, wow, look at this. I just just got this from one of my friends. And so the things that are outside of the very packed, dense text yeah. body are always part of it. And then um, there's another one that I think is also actually, I think, Joel, you guys also have this to David Jackson, June 1953. Um, in the margin next to an ink stain, Merrill makes a marginal note that says excuse spot, <laughs> which no one would ever think to do. But I, because his letters are sort of so pristine, so few errors, I think something like that was, you know, he may have just rewritten the letter for all of his concerns about the ink stain. But yeah, I think we, we actually did have a lot of discussions about texture and making sure these felt like letters without being too overwhelming because a Merrill letter in itself can be a lot to handle. And so to have too much um, sort of preserved on the page seemed like it, it might impede with just reading the letters leisurely. Um, but I think we did a good job, but I'm biased. I think you, I think you did a good job. Uh, and uh, you know, he cared about this kind of thing, like the, like the spot, uh, the details. He always cared about details just one aspect of what Lanny was saying about his attention to the to the page and there's um you know there's a there's a wonderful limited edition special edition of thousand and second night uh which uh, has among the on the page a sun and a moon a tiny it's a tiny booklet and uh but there's a sun and a moon on one page and illustrations and they're colored. And the, I, I wondered if the printer had done it or what. I asked James about it. He said, oh no, he said, uh, I, I did that myself. <laughs> and so at least on some of these booklets, he colored in the tiny sun and the tiny moon <laughs> uh, so that they, they would be just so uh, in those, you know, 30 booklets that were sent out to special people. He, he loved doing special editions and always put his hand in some place. And am I right in remembering on, on this postcard that didn't you notate the 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 Fire Island on on the on the front or the back? However you want to think of it. We did. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the, the, uh, just just for the the um, audience, uh, there, this is this is the first piece of correspondence from um, Merrill to Jackson, uh, and you can see um, that it is a, a message to David, who's gone off to do something in St. Louis, uh, as it happens, um, and uh, Merrill says, "Old Dave," uh, which is a kind of joke. Um, which we're, we don't exactly know the origin of. Uh, such a hot day. I wish I could meet an iceberg like the nice man did. When are you coming <laughs> back? Dot, dot, or a question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, I've planned a little evening, Jay. And then on the other side, you've got this uh, vintage postcard uh, where uh, a couple has um, just uh, encountered each other, I, I suppose. Um, and um, I guess the, the idea is that, you know, when, when you, when you uh, are really knocked off your feet, you've hit an iceberg, you, you're, you, um, you are the Titanic um, and, and about to go down. Um, this is, uh, you know, the message that Merrill is sending after he's really just, not his first meeting with David Jackson, but maybe his first intimate meeting with David Jackson on Fire Island. Uh, not where you expect an iceberg, maybe, uh, but uh, where Merrill found his. <clears throat> I, it, one of the things I wanted to say about um, the letters that, you know, I enjoy as a reader of them and enjoyed as an editor of them and enjoyed as a biographer writing about them is that 
Merrill had so much fun in them. Uh, I mean, he wanted to have fun. He used them to have fun. And you really feel that in his, um, uh, it really enters his correspondence in, the, in a kind of fresh way when he starts writing to Jackson. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that postcard is a nice instance. Uh, his first letter to David uh, is written in a kind of mock child's hand uh, where he is pretending to um, write to his uncle Dave, not old Dave, but now, but uncle Dave. Uh, and he's, he's telling um, a story about his hitchhiking to his father's home on Southampton um, where um, uh, in the course of which uh, the little boy, Jimmy uh, has had to fend off these various um, um, ri uh, rides that would pick him up and, and, and do him no good. Uh, and it's a, it's a very funny letter that ends then, however, when he switches voices into a kind of uh, intimate and, um, and you know, very romantic um, uh, mode. Uh, it, it's really touching, it's really amusing. And, and then you've got right here, this other letter, which is on the Wash U website that Stephen and I did not <clears throat> uh, put in the book. Uh, it seems so much uh, an object in itself. Uh, and in that sense, maybe less, somewhat less a letter. Uh, it's a poem for David on his 40th birthday. Um, you don't necessarily know that it's the 40th birthday until the conceit is uh, revealed at the end of the poem, um, he's saying, you know, I, uh, David, I, you know, I see that you, 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 uh, you have been crying. You, you feel as though you've lost something, but no, um, you, you haven't. Um, you know, look at my face, or look at the face of your friends, uh, and they will show David if he still believes uh, he has been robbed by forty thieves. That in fact uh, he is loved. <clears throat> Love that little uh, gesture tradition, the illumination of the original letter there, the capital P is like a medieval manuscript. Tim, when you were collecting these things, did you ever glance in and see something like this and get surprised or shocked? Um, or yes, I, I did. And um, so I'll tell a bit more later, but I was working as an archivist at Beinecke when I um, was engaged by Sandy and Stephen to help track down letters that were not already at um, St. Louis. And and yes, I did, Stephen, except for, you know, as an archivist, I'm trained to not stop and read everything. Otherwise, yeah. I don't get anything done. So so I would see these things. And especially, I have to tell you, I was struck whenever I was um, looking, getting letters from the 60s and 70s, um, those really, really tight typewritten ones, because those were yeah. ones I could just quickly, you know, glance. And as Lanny said, they were full of really, um, interesting details, right? So I was looking yeah. at them and, and names and stuff like that. But then what really struck me is that when we got to the point where we had made copies and you and uh, Sandy had uh, asked to have a chronologic set. So there's a big, me and several students were, were sorting and we got them and we saw like, oh, here's four letters from June 1st, 1970. And they're all sort of variations of each other. So you started to yeah. see that he was sort of telling some of the same stories, but then couching this one a little bit more ribald for this person. And, and yeah. this one was a little bit more just like repertorial. So that's what got me. And I started to read and think about, okay, it's letter writing, but it's also, you know, it's narrative composition. Yeah. And, and that's what I started to see. I, I don't understand just by the by how you could ever do that. I could never be an archivist. I, you know, I'd get hooked by one of those references uh, and just read on. and. So thank you again. Uh, you wouldn't believe the amount of work that uh, Tim did. And what I think of as an army of elves who must have helped him, but I suspect it was mostly Tim, uh, who, who, it, it, without whom, nothing. Lanny yeah. has the hand raised, so we, we, we should call on him. He, Lanny? You're muted. you're muted, though. You're muted, Lanny. <laughs> That was so that you wouldn't hear the Yale carol on uh, when it was <laughs> playing a few moments ago. Um, uh, yeah, I just looked in the Q&A and there's a question about whether uh, Sandy McClatchy was uh, involved, if at all, in this project. Um, 
Indeed, uh, you know, Sandy really got this going to begin with. And, and Tim, maybe you could talk about that because you worked very closely with him. Um, yeah, and um, I'll, I'll sort of just, uh, uh, I'll keep with the sort of the um, uh, the points of the matter because I could go on at length about Sandy and each of us could about his effect on our lives. Um, so the brief story is, is that um, shortly after um, James Merrill passed away, um, Sandy, who I met one time, came into the Beinecke Library and um, I guess he had heard that I was a new person who had just been there a short while. And so he came to me and he said, oh, we've, we've met and would you like to help me do something? He says, you know, James Merrill's passed away and I am um, working with Stephen Yenser to um, uh, arrange the estate and we need to ship some things to St. Louis, but we also need to give some, some gifts to friends in accordance to his will. I said, okay. So we, they actually uh, he hired me to go to the apartment um, or the building on Water Street in Stonington. And so I started off by going every weekend for two months in 1995 and working through the um, apartment and basically cataloging all the books, finding all the letters, manuscripts, pieces stuffed in, in drawers and looking at things and also making a list of, you know, the mechanical peacock and I mean, all these things, which for me, I didn't read much Merrill as an undergraduate in English literature um, major. So I sort of had this learning experience, life experience, um, archival experience all at once. And it was, it was wonderful and transformative, but I have to say that it was the main driver there was Sandy McClatchy who extended his hand in, in friendship um, and also mentorship to me, which was one of the most important things ever in my life. But anyway, so after we did that and we had um, worked with Stephen to make the bequest, make the disbursements and the shipments to mainly, I think the books, half the books and, and all the, the management materials went to St. Louis. Um, uh, Sandy came back and said, well, the next project is to do the collected letters. And what do you think about that? And I thought, I'm an archivist, sure. You know, it's like what, 30, 40 letters, yeah. <laughs> and, and then he said, okay, well, here, here are two, um, I held these back from, from Washington for a little while. Um, oh, no, no, sorry, so he made photocopies of two no, uh, telephone books. And he said, just contact everybody in these telephone books and ask them if they have letters. I said, okay. So we worked up a approach letter um, together. Um, and then I also made a list of um, libraries. So basically for three years, what I did was I wrote, I just looked at my notes. I had this massive, very old fashioned um, database, um, um, which um, somehow survived <laughs> over the years being translated into new, newer editions and stuff like that. Um, I wrote to 85 libraries and nearly 300 people um, to ask if they had letters um, written by Merrill. Um, and we placed an ad in New York River the Books. Um, word of mouth went out. People just out the transom. And I, I had a PO box at the Yale station. I just got something that says, a friend of mine said you're looking for Merrill letters. And either I got copies or I got the originals. And so the question was, okay, what do we do? We were in, in um, uh, communication with your predecessors um, at um, St. Louis to ask about these things. About half the people said, oh, actually feel free to then, then give the originals to, to St. Louis. Um, some of the people just sent letters, uh, copies, no more communication. Some people were really important. I wrote to about six, seven, eight, ten 10 times. Sandy, I think maybe Stephen, maybe you called them, you, you, you politely nudged them. And we got thousands of letters. Um, and then the question was, okay, <laughs> if it would have been 30 or 40 letters, it's like, boom, let's trans transcribe them. But they were just so wonderful and beautiful and voluminous. And we needed to make two copies and then chronologically rearrange and then make two copies. So there's, I think, uh, four master sets, right? One that's yeah. alphabetical and one that's chronological, one in LA with you and one that actually was in Sandy's house in Stonington, but then after his passing, it went to the Yale Review, but then it's been moved somewhere else, I think, Chelsea, this, where is it? I'm not sure where it is, but it was at the Review when I was working there a couple of years ago. Okay, it's my okay. last last known location for me. Right, right. So, so anyway, so 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 that was it. And, you know, um, I, I could, you know, um, talk more uh, more about what it meant, but, you know, I, I, I was trained as an archivist and the experience for me, besides that, sort of, you know, immersion in the world of Merrill um, and 
the important thing was that it, it put me on the other side of the desk. As an archivist, you know, I was trained, I was young, I thought I knew what, everything I was going to, about research libraries and here's what people want. But when you become a researcher and you're approaching people, many different people um, who don't know who I am and, and you know, you're, you're asking for letters or permission to get copies and like that, uh, it made me realize what that um, both ways of the communication for doing research was about. Um, because also, you know, I was working for the estate, the estate held copyright. There's this interesting thing. Sometimes the library says, well, we have copyright as well. So I had to negotiate with them and say, well, yes, with all due respect, but I'm working for the, the executors. Um, and that, that turned out to be actually very easy, but, um, you know, whenever, um, uh, you know, and also, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, send a check for a dollar and 25 cents for all these copies. So, you know, I, I, I could, I could share my, my checkbook because I paid them out of my, 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 my own, you know, um, account for a dollar 25 and, and then I got reimbursed, but it was an actually an experience. So now I think I understand how researchers are doing work and I've actually had to ask the questions about access and research and, and copyright. Um, and then, you know, um, it went on. I did a, about three years solid work and then maybe about three years sort of on and off work um, uh, until maybe like the early 2000s. Um, but then I think the, um, maybe Stephen, you can talk about this is that a lot of your attention went to the collected poems and other works. So it's not a matter of um, neglect that the correspondence took so long. There's just so much work to, to, that was already in sort of like a master plan for Merrill that the uh, letters actually it needed some time to gestate and things came out of the woodwork and you needed to sort of read the letters and sort of like figure out, you know, which ones were the best ones that wanted to be represented to tell the story. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like a parallel biography, right? So it, autobiography, it, it, it does this thing. So, um, but it was fun. Uh, and I, you know, Tim, I, we, you had so many copies of those letters, as you say, there were four, at least four, yeah. uh, that I, I came as we were nearing the end of the book of letters, the selection, and yeah. uh, really at a turning point, I happened to be in my garage one day, and I found a box, a big box, uh, with your return address, yeah. uh, and I opened it up, and here are these letters there must have been 300 letters, you know, and I thought, my God, you know, and we've, we've already got 400 pages of letters. <laughs> what are these? And I went, I got them out and I looked through them and look, I finally figured out that the, they were ones that were done chronologically. So they okay. were all duplicated, but I mean, it terrified me <laughs> that we had found this cache of letters probably the most crucial ones he ever wrote, you know, were sitting here rotting in my garage. But day after day, these things would come in from Tim. Um, it, it was astounding. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we, we sent you that, that's why we had two sets to see uh, the letters even to keep you honest. We want to make sure, you know, <laughs> we, we had the set of record and then we had yours. <laughs> it all worked out. Steve and I, I'm that easy, man. Yeah. as, you and Sandy as, as co-executors, did you have uh, any indication of an expectation from Merrill himself that there would be any kind of published letter or that you should gather them or was no. this all your own initiative? Well, I think anybody who knew James, no, that's not true. The, a few people who, who knew him very well knew all along that he wanted his letters published. Mm -hmm. It was... Uh, or he wanted them retained anyway, and somebody else could do what they wanted to do with them. But this just infused all of his letter writing. You know, those were letters written for posterity. Uh, I mean, he had a lot of fun doing it, he, uh, but, um, but he, he knew that they would be collected. Um, so it, it went without saying. And everything he did, you know, was in that, in regard to epistles was directed to that end. Um, look at that, that letter that uh, you have from uh, to Peter Hooten while he's sleeping. Uh -huh. This is a note to Peter, it never got sent through the mail mm -hmm. uh, and very personal, but you know, fascinating for the biographer. And there it is. Now, how did that get saved? See, it's, uh, 
James had a big box beside his desk and he put manuscripts and letters and things into that box and then they went off to St. Louis. So he would have saved this letter. I, Peter Hooten probably did not. But, or maybe he did, I don't know. Anyway, but this is a letter that was not a letter, it was a note to his lover and, you know, it, but it got saved. Mm -hmm. Everything got saved. James, waste not, want not, was one of his major rules. He saved, he preserved. Yeah. Not just things about him, but, you know, things having to do with other people too. He, and, and, and that got me curious too, like, you know, after 64, I mean, he, he started depositing papers in an archive here. Um, do you think he got a little bit more performative or a little, you know, did that affect the content of the letters? Do you think? No. No. I think it was there from the beginning. He, hmm. he knew whatever. I, Mona Van Dyne had such great foresight and she, and she was very lucky too. Uh, but uh, somehow those letters would have been one day would have would have come if not to you to Yale or to somebody else as in people right. I didn't see any change at all in the letters he, he wasn't writing for anybody any differently Lanny you you wanted to add something yeah well you know um, these are people who you know um, read letters uh, who I mean that is to say published letters for whom a writer's letters were part of who they were and, and the work that they did um, so that you see that self-consciousness um, in, in various ways. There's a, there's a postscript that David Jackson writes in a letter that James Merrill writes to Claude Fredericks in I believe 19, let's say uh, 56, um, in which um, David jokes with Claude um, about future biographers reading the letter that he that he's writing the postscript to um, and so that's in 1956 so he's already kind of thinking about this um, you know they've read Henry James uh, the aspirin papers they've uh, this this is part of what what the literary lives that they're creating um, uh, entail um, however that said um, I, I think a couple of things about Merrill, while there's a, you know, arch acute self-consciousness at all times, um, I think that there's a kind of, um, that is so naturalized on his part that, um, that there's no inauthenticity. There's no sort of looking over his shoulder when he's writing. Uh, it is a kind of performance that is just part of what he, everything he writes. There, there's still uh, some sincere and letters to his friends and at the same abs time there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, and relatedly, what I find very interesting is that as, as Stephen uh, is saying, um, you know, Merrill kept maybe not everything, but but he cleared a lot off his desk to put it in that box that went to St. Louis. Although you could say it's interesting some of the things he didn't send. He didn't send a lot of his financial records, for instance. But uh, be that as it may, he sent a lot of, a lot of his life and a lot of, um, a, a, a lot of the ways in which his life connected to very many other people. And he put very few restrictions on it. Um, that is uh, to say, he didn't, although he was creating an archive, he didn't tell us what to do with it. Yeah, that does for other people to figure out. So I wonder. I think, I think it's. I think it's really admirable. Uh, I mean, I, I, he he. Uh, I, I think he really did not try to, in that sense, shape his image in ways that you see people doing all the time. Um, he he gave a lot of material <laughs> for uh, readers, for biographers, for uh, archivists. Um, to do what they would with it. I want to get um, get a little bit more from Chelsea when you came in. Uh, you know, I, I get the impression from the book that you were really heavily involved from you know turning the letters from manuscript or typescript into what we see in the book. And 
could you go a little bit into what all you did with letters? And I would love to. I'm sure Lainey and Steven will make it sound like I did even more than I did. Um, but I got involved in fall of 2015 when I was mm. a recently defected medievalist to contemporary poetry. Lainey won um, that <laughs> war. Um, mm. And I was just talking about some wanting some research assistant work and Lanny overheard me and he's like, well, I've got, I've got something to keep you occupied. Um, and so, you know, dozens and dozens of boxes of letters later, sort of, I think we laid them all out in Lanny's office he was moving into. So Lanny, you couldn't occupy it for months because I just had letters everywhere. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it was, taking this sort of repositories Tim's talking about of these photocopies and going through them and making sense of them based on sort of an ever-changing list of letters that we knew were from somewhere and then had to locate um, and typing them up. So, you know, I'm, I'm young to the venture only having worked on it for five years, mm -hmm. but really I think just transcribing the letters is where I came in most prominently and helping with the notes, which were very fun. That might've been the most fun part for mm -hmm. me. <laughs> well, the, the notes, uh, you, were, you were crucial on a number of occasions and I do want you to tell us about the light bulb. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think um, there should be a photo of this somewhere, but let me find the letter here. Okay. Um, so there is a letter to Elizabeth Bishop in 1972 and there's this one reference that we could not figure out and it's to a geo price bulb. So in context, it says it's about WH Auden and Chester Coleman's very messy apartment, um, which is interesting because John Updike said that James Merrill lived in dignified clutter. So this, this is sort of telling that Merrill thought that Auden's apartment was um, sort of a sty. Um, <laughs> he says, um, you know, D David Jackson says, you know, won't you miss New York? He asked Auden, whose fond gaze thereupon took in cracked picture glass, disemboweled sofa, piles of sooty papers everywhere, the kitchen's iris of roaches shimmering faintly in the light of a geo price bulb. And so through some very strategic Googling and honestly, I think just days of refusing That's to give geo, up. That's G-E-O period, right? G-E-O period. Geo Yes, bulb. Um, I figured out this was cartoonist George Price, who. Ha he ah, had there we go. <laughs> yes, he signed Geo Price. You can see in the bottom right hand corner, and he had these very sort of zany light bulbs that were always, you know, there's wires coming down. This is very characteristic one, um, and his cartoons are often in domestic spaces that are not ideally kept up. So yeah, that was, that's what I think certainly Stephen and Lanny think is my greatest victory in the book. And I'll, I'll certainly take it, but we all had good notes, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right. Uh, Stephen correctly identified Bumble Dawson. That yes. was impressive. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, let's, yeah, well, Lanny, you, you did, you, I, I don't know how to get at the, your discovery of the reference uh, at the, <laughs> To a letter in which James is recounting a wedding, I I don't I don't know if, I don't know who's watching this. We can't go into that. <laughs> uh, anyway, we you can see what what research leads to. It's, it's a wonder we're we're still sane. Joel, you had a lot of stuff you wanted to get over today, and I think we've crowded a bunch out. What what do you need to tuck in? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the time, and we're we're at four fifty one. I want to. Uh, be aware of people's time. We, we may go over past past the hour. If, if whoever wants to stick around, if that's okay. Yeah, great. Right. Um, but um, and I do want to get to any audience questions in the Q and A. It looks like we have a few. We we addressed one about um, Sandy McClatchy. Um, there's one here from Mark Harrington. Hello, wonderful panel. I would love for you guys to speak a little bit about how. Merrill's letters serve to capture event and time as diary, journal, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, he, you know, he said in one of his letters to, I think it was to Irma Brandeis, that uh, she asked him about, uh, about his notebook, his diary that he was keeping when he was traveling. He said, I, I can't do a diary. I, the letters have to bear the whole burden. 
And so rather than diaries, he, he wrote letters. And, and again, he knew somehow those letters would be kept. And, you know, he never had to tell his friends that these letters should be kept. Anybody looking at them could tell this was a letter to be kept. And so his descriptions of landscapes, of paintings, of, of pieces of music, uh, it's all there. And Lanny, am I right in thinking his journals? A lot of were more for drafting poems than today. This and that happened. Or? Well, I mean, you know, the the, the diaries are, are so or notebooks are are so different because you, you they're they're wonderful, uh, and they are um, a kind of view of Merrill that you don't get elsewhere. They are. Uh, they're, they are, as it were, him thinking to himself uh, on the page. And what is so marvelous and different about the letters is that he is thinking for someone else. Uh, he is, um, Mark uh, asked about, you know, how the letters capture a moment or a place, and they do. Uh, and, there, and there's a kind of, um, drive or urgency that he feels as well as a kind of opportunity to somehow communicate um, the moment that he is in uh, with uh, his correspondent. Um, and so they're very much about kind of, yeah, sharing a place in the moment and the day, uh, et cetera. And it's part of the effect that you have in his letters of a kind of uh, intensity of uh, personal presence. That's a little bit more well, the, intense in the letters than in the journal. Uh, different. Uh, I mean, you know, as I say, the you know the letter, uh, the letter is a, is a kind of, um, you you could say almost a kind of collaboration with an addressee. Uh, that is, it's a you know it's a kind of dialogue and monologue form uh, in which uh, um, a moment is being shared and, and, and there's there's all kinds of you know personal performance involved in that and you know also Merrill's also entertaining himself. The one thing that, that strikes me Lenny is right of course about the difference between the notebooks and the letters but one thing that always strikes me uh, about James's work is how one genre bleeds into the other mm. and so um, it's not uncommon for him to uh, break off in a, in a letter especially as as he gets older and to uh, take up a different different subject or stop himself and revise what he was just saying as he might in the notebook. Sometimes drafts of poems appear in the, in the letters. Uh, not too often, but sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, um, and on his, in his notebooks, you will find um, you know, recipes, bits of recipes with telephone numbers of, of friends. They, they were not just, you know, something you would sit down at the end of a day like his friend Claude Fredericks would do and record the whole day or something, but it, it was for, the notebooks would catch up anything. And I think if it could be written, it was a part of his life. And it was a part, and so the notebooks became the letters got in and, and they, that got into the poems. Uh, the, the language is this great sea that he swims about in. Um, and the, the, the genres are not all that distinct often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like to plug just for a second on the sort of recipe thing. One of my favorite moments in this letter, because these letters is to you, Stephen, where he gives you a recipe for an omelet souffle. Yes. Which I have made multiple times and it is excellent. It works. I highly definitely. recommend. It's very good. He had good taste. Yeah. Another <laughs> reason to get the book. Yeah. <laughs> And, and Stephen, you, you mentioned in the last event about the kind of experience of receiving letters from Merrill. Um, and, you know, I think I'd love to Make hear a little bit more about, about your, I mean, he was your, he was your teacher and, you know, he was, you know, a fellow poet, but also 20 some years older, right? Um, and 15. probably looked up to him, 15. Um, you know, was there any kind of, uh, you know, uh, intimidation factor, or I mean, was it like, how okay. did it feel like writing to, to James Merrill, you know, like, I, I, I would be intimidated. <laughs> oh, God, yes. Uh, it, it got easier over the years. 
see, mo much of our relationship was uh, correspond uh, chorus was in correspondence because uh, we didn't right. often live in the same town, although we, we did. Uh, and so I got, got used to it after a while, but yes, terribly intimidating. I mean, look at those letters. And then, you know, early on, he would kid me about, about my letters. I remember him saying something to me once about how he could see I'd been setting that pun up for a couple of paragraphs. <laughs> and it was true, you know. Uh, he, he was a good reader and you know, he saw exactly what I was doing. It's transparent to him. So, th I mean, that's doubly intimidating. <laughs> uh, but eventually I kind of got used to it and getting his letters was, you know, it was like, I don't know, getting a, a great periodical, you know, and you just sit down and be entertained for the day. And, and, all, and he would write about, we would write about the work we were doing, which is one thing that we didn't get in the book, which I regret sometimes. Uh, there is very little in the book of letters about technical work, about the specifics, about the uh, hammers, the nails, the screws of the poems. Uh, and James was an excellent reader. He was an excellent critic. He helped a lot of people with a lot of poems and novels, the details. And it's just, it's not there. And we made a decision to keep some of that out, a lot of it out. Uh, because a lot of people wouldn't be interested. Mm. Uh, they're more interested in gossip and in uh, the puns. And, uh, you know, the, uh, so that's another book. Yeah, as someone said in the chat. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm curious about that. If you had to cut a letter because you have this um, editorial principle to keep the whole letter in. And so if there's yeah. just one or set, two sentences, you'd really love to have, but the rest of it. Yes. You just can't go in. I, I'm glad we made that decision early on because if we hadn't, we would have spent a lot of time later mm. cutting up letters, which just would have been impossible. Uh, we, were, we were very fortunate in that regard to have made that decision. I have to ask any any fights come up between you two? And, and oh, include or not? Never. Never. No. No, all the time. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, of course. You mean, you've heard him. No. Okay. No. That's good. You're you're gentle on each other. No, Lanny's no. He's he's he, you know he's got his perfection aside. He tries to hide it, but you know it's it's there. And um, sure, we we disagreed about. Uh, any number of things. Uh, there's a lot of fun. Almost everything. And when I was in Stonington, we go have some drinks and, and continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm just looking at the Q&A here. Uh, Henry Cole is asking about, uh, can we say more about the death mask? Uh, that's always a popular topic. Uh, when when uh, uh, I, I can say something very quickly about it. Um, <laughs> Death Mask was, uh, uh, was made in New York after um, Merrill's body uh, was um, brought there from uh, Arizona and uh, it was made at uh, um, the, uh, at Peter's decision, Peter Hooten's decision. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there was no instruction for that uh, from James Merrill. And then Peter had it bronze as well, right? I, yeah, I assume so. Oh, yeah. Um, Randy Bean from the James Marl House and Washu wants to know what's next for our uh, our co-editors. Any more Merrill projects in the works? <laughs> Are you uh, <laughs> not answering that right now? <laughs> yeah, La Chelsea and I uh, thought about approaching Lanny to do all the postcards. Yeah, Recto, I stand behind that. Recto and Verso. I like uh, that idea. The, the complete postcards. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm down. Yeah. So was, did, did you guys entertain the notion of, of uh, reproducing uh, any of the correspondence, uh, you know, in addition to or instead of photos of correspondence? Um, and what if you mean in the book or? In the book, yeah. Yeah, we thought about it. Um, there was just so much to do. Yeah. Um, you know, I hope this is not utterly irrelevant. It struck me that uh, that I should that that we should mention 
at some point, uh, the wonderful bibliography that Jack Hagstrom uh, did uh, for, of Merrill's work. It's a descriptive bibliography and he, he put it together with, with the help from, of, uh, of a friend or two. Uh, and it's a wonderful bibliography. I mean, it, it catalogs the blurbs that Merrill wrote for books. You right. wanna know which books Merrill blurbed? You can find them all here. Uh, it catalogs the books that are dedicated to Merrill, the poems that are dedicated to Merrill. Um, it's everything having to do with Merrill that Jack could get his hands on, he did, and he put it together in this wonderful bibliography, which uh, the bibliographer's task is one I do not understand, I do stand in awe of, and I think that anybody doing any work on Merrill ought to look at Hagstrom's book. There are riches untold there. Mm -hmm. That's a good plug. Um, let's see. Uh, there a, was a question about um, uh, Merrill's correspondence. Is, um, I, I suppose the other side of, of Merrill's correspondence is in particular uh, with W.H. Auden. And I've never seen a letter that uh, Merrill wrote to Auden. Uh, or one from Auden to Merrill. Um, one thing that strikes me about his letters um, is that the great majority of them are written to intimate friends uh, on whom he had, with whom he had very developed personal relationships. And there's, there's less um, what I would describe as sort of public seeming correspondence uh, in, in, his, uh, in his letters. And, and so, in fact, um, there, are, um, there are not a lot of you know, grand names, I think, in his correspondent list. Um, he's, one, of, one of the correspondences that I think he, he was uh, more self-conscious about uh, was uh, his letters to Mary McCarthy, uh, whom he regarded as, you know, uh, a name that that was up in marquee lights, and 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 I, I think there's a certain kind of stiffness that you feel in the letters that he writes to her. Um, he was much more comfortable writing to people who either were his friends, uh, his intimate friends, or who could be in some way um, um, uh, made to made to feel uh, on some level uh, intimate. Um, and in that sense, almost a more private kind of uh, communication. Yeah, the, the one letter that, one of the few letters to McCarthy that we have in the book it responds to her questions about some poems in one of his books. And he, he treats her as he treats nobody else. He goes down the list of questions. You can tell he doesn't do, say that, but just answering questions about what something stands for or represents or uh, and it's it's like a, a response to an uh, to an exam almost the answers <laughs> he gives about these poems to McCarthy and it's very funny yeah. um, I don't know what it says about the relationship yeah. how do you there's a question here that I'll, I'll uh, adapt a little bit how do you speculate a little bit about how Merrill would have uh, taken to social media texting email all that stuff that we do nowadays and instead of writing letters. <laughs> um, well, he loved the computer. Um, I, I think he would be a mean tweeter. <laughs> oh, amen. Yeah, he would be. <laughs> there would be a learning curve though. Like when he first gets his electric and his, his word processor, there's letters that we have where he's like, help this machine. It's, I don't know yeah. what to do, <laughs> but he would be into it, I think. And you mean an avid tweeter, right, Lanny? Not, not, not a aggressive. <laughs> because we have enough of those. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. No one would ban him. Yeah. Yeah. People would but welcome. Seriously, his the the letter form, I I think more and more, is is on the way out. Uh, I don't get any letters anymore. I mean, occasionally I get a letter. Uh, I got, a, got an email the other day from an old friend apologizing for not writing a letter. Um, 
but I mean, these could be really the last great letters. I mean, these are letters, you know, but you don't see these, this kind of thing anymore. And I can't think of another genre, uh, literary genre that has just disappeared in, in the last couple of hundred years. So it's, it's a sad thing, I think. It, Stephen, um, so I don't know if you remember, but one of the, the early dinners we had in Stonington when I first started gathering some of the letters, and it was a very lovely, you know, rollicking evening at yes. the small restaurants, talked about a lot of things, but I, I think one, at one point in the dinner, and it was Yumi, um, Sandy, my boyfriend, and so just for us, and we're talking about letters and what we'd found. And um, then Sandy said, well, when he drafted this, and you said, he drafted this, I said, what? And then Sandy turned to me and said, I mean, but, but you, of course you draft your letter before you then write out the complete version. It's like, and I realized, it's like, oh my God, that's what an adult does. <laughs> and since then, seriously, because he took it seriously, and it was like a little mini lesson, like he always liked to give, that it's like, oh, I'm writing a letter. You draft a letter like you draft any piece of writing, and then you write it, you know, um, so it flows um, as <laughs> a, a final version. And that was a very important thing to do, but that's another thing to do with that, you know, is it, is it you know, something that's just completely sort of organic and, and spontaneous, or is it, is it like a piece of creative writing, like other more formal forms? Mm -hmm. And I think that that, that I see is, a, is, a, is also a break about yeah. how much thought goes into that final version of a letter. Of course, yeah, that would be true for me, for example. My letters to James would go through several drafts, uh, but uh, James never. Uh, he wrote with what one of his characters is, is said to have an unrelenting fluency, and that was James. He didn't draft letters. He didn't have to. He just, I, the, the, it's, it's, an, it's extra, ex extraordinary. Mm -hmm. The way the mind and the and the fingers worked with with Merrill. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I would see some in, in in his journal. I don't know if Lenny you remember any, um, maybe rough drafts, but um, I think probably the more difficult ones to write. Maybe you know um, that that took a little bit more finesse. Yeah, I shouldn't shouldn't have said that so exclusively, but but he did not. I mean. He didn't really draft letters, or at least not the way I drafted letters. Mm -hmm. But then that's a weird way. So, yeah. I, I see in the, the chat that, that uh, Brandon is asking about um, secrecy in the letters, and in particular, um, the way in which the letters do or do not uh, disclose uh, Merrill's HIV diagnosis. Um, and you know, before I was talking about uh, Merrill's remarkable um, readiness to um, have all of his writing archived um, and relatively open and available. Um, and I think I'd have to qualify that a little bit to say that he's also, you know, very careful about what he says. Um, about certain things, uh, and his HIV diagnosis is one of them. I mean, you can you can read uh, the published letters uh, in you know in our book, and you can see various moments of acknowledgement, um, but they're not very explicit. Um, the only um, occasions, uh, the the single occasion that I know of, um, where he indicates. Uh, in very explicit terms that he has HIV uh, is in his notebook entry when he's reacting to his first test result in 1986. Um, and I suppose you could say um, that the absence of, of more explicit or specific reference to his diagnosis in his letters subsequent to that is a kind of self-censorship, or at any rate, um, let's just call it carefulness, um, that, that shows you know, a certain kind of consciousness about not wanting to put in writing something he doesn't want read. Yes, uh, th that is the one actually area that I can think of. I think it's singular 
but he was he was indeed fierce about that and uh, people knew inevitably uh, that he was ill uh, but he didn't always know that they knew and he I remember his getting furious with a rather distant relative who seemed to have left the cat out of the bag which in fact he, the person was just saying something a lot of people had suspected for a long time but James is absolutely furious that uh, this would become knowledge and I think it's the um, it's the super ego huh uh, his his mother, uh, right there, always thinking about what if, what if my mother knows what it, what is it going to do to her, and and to her circle of friends and uh, the impact on all of that. Um, so he, that is the one thing he was very careful about. I think otherwise he was very honest and straightforward, mm -hmm. like, you know, depending on the correspondent. <laughs> Uh, there's there's a question here from Willard Spiegelman about uh, how about sensitivity to other people's personal lives. Um, did you decide not to include any because of that? No, no. Are you not going to say? Yeah, that's. Uh, no, we're Lanny and I don't have that sensitivity. <laughs> Uh, Kelly Yunser is asking, has anyone here written to James using the Ouija board on the other side of the us? The Ouija board is, I guess, another, obviously, a big um, aspect of correspondence in, in Merrill's life, but it's a whole other topic. <laughs> well, it, it is. Was the question, has anybody been in touch with James? Yeah, it's, it's you know, um, over the Ouija board. Probably. Uh, the people who began using the Ouija board after James came out of that particular closet uh, is extraordinary. All kinds of people uh, went crazy about the Ouija board. They loved it and they would hear it had been officially sanctioned. It was even literary. You know? mm -hmm. And I'm sure that a lot of people have been in touch with something over there that says they are JM, but I haven't heard about it. Mm -hmm. I'll just add that, I mean, um, through and well, anyway, the the handwritten Ouija board and the cracked uh, teacup ended up at Beinecke because um, uh, Sandy was interested in a few objects also being populated there. And we put it on display. We had a, a new acquisition show about six years ago and people were either absolutely fascinated or like terrified <laughs> because yeah. the Ouija board, you know, the first thing, first thing they, if they know Merrill, they think of a Merrill, otherwise they think of the exorcist, right? So it, yeah. it, it just, it was like the object, the two objects that sort of like just sat there and caused intense emotion when people saw them. Um, a lot of it was affection, but a lot of it was, you know, um, uh, and I remember asking Sandy saying, was it all true? And he said, I don't know, Tim, was it all true? I mean, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, and because I, 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 at Water Street, I read all of um, The Changing Light of Sandover and, and, and you know, saw Mirabelle looking at me. Um, so, yeah. Well, we live in the age of QAnon, so probably, all, all those people would, were at the Biden key um, <laughs> look, looking at the, at the Ouija board. Yeah. But it did occur to me when reading the book that, you know, that the Ouija board really is, um, you know, it, it, it's part of Merrill's love of corresponding with, you know. Yes. Um, well, he, he calls the letters love letters from the other world. Hmm. Uh, that's how he speaks of the, the transcripts. Mm -hmm. Yep. All ties together. And in his um, early poem, where, which is one of the first poems where I think he's kind of trying to process some of the Ouija board stuff from the cupola, he retells the story of Eros and Psyche. And Eros and Psyche communicate by letters. Mm. And you can see the, you know, the letters to his mother where he's you know, communicating what he's learning about mm. that Ephraim is telling him. Um, just kind of spilling it out to her. Yeah, that, uh, that was a very important letter in the book. I think he was so clear to her about how it worked. Mm -hmm. And that was a necessary letter in the book. He, this is the way it goes. And it was very helpful. Well, and he says, um, 
think what you will, I believe it all. <laughs> and you know, I, you probably would take that back, you know, the next day. Um, but it's interesting, in fact, that he wants to assert that to his mother. Yeah, um, and um, make the point. Well, a number of us, I think, saw James when he was in really in the heat of the the correspondence with the other world. Um, and you know you can't you can't fake that kind of feeling about something's out there. And I remember talking to him and being impressed by the degree to which he he had a faith that something was talking to him. He didn't know what it was. Now, of course, at the same time, often he would say that he was ambivalent as he was about everything. But. You they'd see these intense, hot moments where he, he was worried about what he was in touch with. Well, uh, I, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Joel. Yeah, I just wanted to see if anybody wanted to address any other questions uh, that have been raised or say anything else. Um, I don't want to, you know, I hate to cut it off, but I also don't want to, you know, uh, keep people forever. Um, Laura, does that? Go ahead. I, I'll, I'll just say, uh, I just noticed a, a question about uh, elitism in the uh, world of the Ouija board. And I'll just say, yeah. uh, while we're talking about the Ouija board, there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, and not all of it is, is uh, pretty attractive or uh, uh, otherwise uh, approvable. Um, and um, what do we do with that? that that's, a, that's a kind of big question. Um, I would invite anyone who's interested in that question to read James Merrill's letters uh, mm -hmm. and, and see, see what you think about uh, what the person who wrote those letters thinks. Good advice. Yeah. Well, I want to thank every, you know, my panelists. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Just Thank you, Joel, for uh, putting this all together. And my for pleasure, for sure. That your archive, it, it really is, it's wonderful to get little glimpses of it, the, the way in which things run so smoothly and beautifully at Wash U is, is impressive. I mean, I'm sure the same must be true at Yale, but uh, I'm more familiar <laughs> with, with you. Um, yeah, yeah, anyway. We uh, all support great. each other. I mean, the, uh, all right. <laughs> the pursuit of a greater knowledge of literature. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's another fun aspect of this is, is the collaborative. Uh, nature with with Beinecke and, and the Merrill House. And, and Do you have at Wash U everything that the Beinecke has? Uh, objects aside in the in the correspondence. Do you have copies? No, no. Okay. Um, yeah. I didn't know the extent of the collaboration. Because you, you have, I mean, we got a lot uh, that, that Nancy uh, Cole gave us uh, for the website. Uh, of, of uh, letters to you and, and, and journals of, about Ephraim, which was just amazing. Because um, those were like the first kind of the, the, when it was at its mm -hmm. um, starting stages and uh, really formative years. Um, so we have those on our website. Um, <clears throat> we did get yeah, I was just, you know, the letters to Sandy McClatchy um, that uh, Sandy and Landy sent after the 2015 symposium here, which which we put in, which is, which is of course great to have. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, and, and there are other, you know, and I think that's another great thing about your book is it really shows the range of uh, repositories uh, that, that have Merrill materials. 